Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, so um, my talk is going to be uh, going to be a little bit less technical than previous talks. Uh, this is uh, a presentation of my recent survey paper about the state of knowledge and the research perspectives of <coughs> Ethereum. Ethereum is my main research topic. I'm the PhD student in the University of Luxembourg, and I'm going to present you this, uh, in my opinion, very fascinating topic, uh, which some of you might be interested in. So I will give a motivation why why this is interesting. I will briefly give a technical overview of uh, how blockchains work and how Ethereum works in particular, and I will outline some open problems in, uh, in this area. So uh, why give this talk? Why discuss this topic? Uh, Ethereum is, at least in my opinion, a fascinating research topic. It um, contains uh, parts of various research field, st fields, starting from cryptography, cryptographic primitives, up to distributed systems and consensus algorithms, programming languages, security and privacy, game theory and economics and finance, and even law and more higher level issues. So basically on every level of this, of this stack, you can find some interesting unsolved challenges. And this area uh, can provide you with research questions of uh, uh, very high practical relevance. So there is a saying about uh, Bitcoin that Bitcoin works in practice but not in theory. So this um, uh, systems are deployed already. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other blockchains, they work. They hold um, uh, tens of billions of dollars in value, even more than a hundred billions of dollars. But still, um, there is a very little academic rigorous research that would prove that the systems are correct, they are, that they are secure or not, which privacy guarantees they provide, and so on. So, to start from the beginning, to, for the sake of completeness, I will mention Bitcoin, which I suppose many of you are familiar with. Uh, it is where it all started. It was introduced by um, an anonymous entity under the name Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, and it is the first fully decentralized digital currency. Um, uh, it manages to solve uh, an old problem in um, this area of research, in digital cash, um, uh, using a new technique called proof of work. It combines cryptography and economic incentive, incentives for participants to prevent double spending uh, without any centralized third party. So previously in all the research in digital currencies, there was this problem if Alice is sending some digital coin to Bob and she's sending some, the same digital coin to Charlie, there was no way without a trusted third party to keep track of which of the transactions is, is actually valid. So Bitcoin managed, managed to solve this problem using uh, a consensus algorithm known as proof of work. Uh, but Bitcoin is not the main topic uh, of my talk. The main topic of my talk is Ethereum. Ethereum is uh, a generalized blockchain system. It inherits um, many of the design choices of Bitcoin, but it differs from it in various aspects. It was introduced in 2014 by Vitalik Buterin and uh, launched in 2015. And the key aspect, the key um, value proposition of Ethereum is Turing complete programming capabilities. So contrary to Bitcoin, where you can only write very simplistic scripts that determine who can spend uh, the Bitcoins that you sent, um, in Ethereum you can write complex programs and you can uh, implement some complex logic in uh, these pieces of code stored on the blockchain, which are usually referred to as smart contracts. So here are some of the features of, of Ethereum. Again, not going into that much technical detail. You can look it up in the paper where I describe how it works internally and give uh, links to relevant documentation and relevant papers. But basically, uh, there are two types of accounts in Ethereum. The accounts controlled by a private key, uh, like in Bitcoin, and the second type of accounts controlled by code. These are called smart contracts. The developers can write uh, smart contracts usually in high-level languages. The most popular high-level language is called Solidity, and I will discuss it uh, later uh, in this presentation. Uh, so, these high-level languages are compiled to Ethereum virtual machine bytecode, and the bytecode is deployed onto the blockchain and stored in a blockchain uh, maintained by this peer-to-peer -peer network of nodes. And then, if users want to interact with my smart contract, they issue transactions, um, they specify some execution arguments, or they uh, provide some cryptocurrency in addition to that, and the smart contract responds to incoming transactions in, um, in the manner specified by, uh, by the programmer in advance. Um, there are multiple reasons why security is hard in Ethereum. So security is like the central concept here. Uh, first of all, um, it's the new software stack. It's been developed from scratch starting in 2014, I suppose. 
so the developers are um, implementing um, uh, the, the, the base layer of the infrastructure, the programming languages and compilers, the consensus algorithm, uh, the uh, cryptography and the um, all, all kinds of stuff, the virtual machine. Um, this, um, the software stack, which is so complicated, it's hard to get right on the first try and uh, bugs and some problems are still being discovered. Uh, from the pro programmer's point of view, uh, it is a new, unfamiliar execution paradigm. So the code of smart contract is not like, executed uh, on, uh, like in a cloud or on a laptop or a mobile device. It is executed by a network of nodes, which, um, which are anonymous mostly, and which may have their own economic incentives. So they may try to somehow subvert the execution, they may try to feed um, malicious data into smart contract if they are economically incentivized to do so, and the programmer has to keep that in mind. Um, uh, moreover, a programmer has very limited ability to patch contracts. One of the key features of, uh, blockchain, uh, of blockchains is immutability. So when a smart contract is deployed onto the network, it cannot be modified. Its, its code is, uh, is, is there forever, at least if you do not implement some kind of additional update mechanism, but again, you have to think about it that in advance. That means that um, if there is any bug, any vulnerability is discovered, uh, you basically can do nothing about that. Just uh, it, it will be exploited. Uh, it will be exploited by anonymous, financially motivated attackers. So the security landscape is very is very harsh, um, and there is another another saying in this field that um, smart contracts that hold some significant amount of money uh, are their own bug bounty. So um, hackers can exploit vulnerabilities, and in 2016 and 2017, we have seen many cases of high-profile hacks of smart contracts, and up to tens of millions of dollars uh, were stolen, and um, nobody got punished for that. I mean, the kind of traditional law enforcement means of punishment, because these hackers are anonymous and nobody is able to find them. And uh, last but not least, due to the rapid pace of development in this field, due to this recent hype in the blockchain space, everybody is rushing into the market, everybody is trying to, to um, uh, deploy some project as fast as possible without paying much attention to security, um, which is um, interesting from the security researchers' point of view. So now I'm going to um, go through the uh, through some of the uh, layers of the Ethereum stack. I will uh, tell something about how this works internally and outline some open challenges. So starting from the very ba basic level, the, uh, the cryptography used in Ethereum mostly um, is fine as far as I can tell. Uh, it uses elliptic curve cryptography for digital signatures, and it uses um, CACHAC-256 for hashes for identifiers of transactions, blocks, and all kinds of stuff. But uh, for proof-of-work, it uses hash function that you probably have never heard of. It is called ethash. Uh, and this hash function was um, developed specifically for Ethereum in 2013-2015. It is supposed to be memory-hard cryptographic hash function, and Again, as far as I know, I was not able to find any um, proper academic paper which would rigorously um, analyze this, the security of this hash function. So this may be an interesting research topic for people interested in cryptographic primitives. Um, there were some claims um, of weaknesses of this hash function in earlier versions, which probably have been fixed since. But uh, still, I should mention also on this slide that Ethereum is, uh, is planning to abandon uh, proof-of-work consensus altogether, and uh, probably next year, so this problem will no longer be a problem after that, if this update is successful, and after this update happens. So uh, then going to the consensus layer. So as, as I previously mentioned, um, Ethereum uses uh, proof-of-work as consensus, and I will here briefly describe it, uh, how it works. So uh, nodes, which are in this context called uh, miners, they are competing with each other to produce the next block. What they are doing essentially is they are trying to find the nonce uh, such that a nonce hashed together with the block header produces a value which is less than some target specified by the protocol. The block header contains information about all the transactions in the block and is uh, specific for that particular block. And the first miner who, um, who finds such nonce gets an automatic reward in cryptocurrency. Obviously, if the hash function is cryptographic and unpredictable, the only way that you can do it is by brute force search. And that's what miners do, and the probability of success uh, is dependent on the hashing power of miners. Uh, proof of work has its um, has its drawbacks. 
For instance, uh, Bitcoin is estimated to consume um, an insane amount of electricity. If Bitcoin were a country, it would stand on the um, line number 70 in the list of countries by energy consumption. This corresponds to a country with a few millions of inhabitants. So I, I, I'm not sure if there are similar statistics to Ethereum, but uh, still proof of work consumes large amounts of power. Uh, there is also risks of centralization, because uh, if miners are incentivized to do these very, um, uh, very specific computations, they are, they are incentivized to invest in very specialized equipment and they can benefit from economies of scale. That means, for example, that Bitcoin mining is more or less centralized in China with huge mining farms with very specialized equipment. And uh, the early days where every Bitcoin enthusiast could mine on their own computer are long gone. In Ethereum, uh, this problem is not so, um, uh, is, is, is not, uh, is, is, is this um, uh, manifest itself to lesser scale because of another hash function, uh, but still, uh, in principle, it is the same. And also, some game theoretical attacks have been discovered. Uh, it turns out that proof of work is not so, uh, so incentive compatible, so to say, so uh, pure from the game theoretical pr perspective. There is such thing as selfish mining, so miners can. Um, uh, can um, attack, so to say, their colleagues and other miners and make them lose money while gaining uh, more than a fair share of the profit. So, uh, despite the fact that this problem are less obvious in Ethereum, Ethereum is still planning to transition to another consensus protocol to solve these problems. This another uh, consensus protocol is called Proof-of-Stake. Uh, the main idea here is that uh, validators are chosen uh, not proportionally to their computing power as in Proof-of-Work, but proportionally to their stake, uh, that means to the, to the amount of units of cryptocurrency that they hold. So uh, this is often described as virtual mining. So if imagine that I have a thousand euros, which I want to invest in, um, in mining cryptocurrencies and validate new transactions and earn some uh, rewards. In case of proof of work, I will buy a physical, uh, physical device, I will plug it in into the electricity supply, I will consume energy and I will um, hopefully get some rewards from that. In proof of stake, instead of buying uh, actual equipment, I will buy some amount of cryptocurrency and the algorithm will choose the next validator randomly uh, with the probability proportional to the stake. So I will earn the proportional amount of income. So this idea has been uh, around for a while, I suppose in the cryptocurrency space in general since about 2011 or something. And uh, for the naive implementations, there are some problems which are addressed in various ways by, diff by various alternative proof-of-stake designs. The one problem is called nothing at stake. That means that if, uh, if an attacker is trying to produce an alternative, um, an alternative branch of the blockchain, uh, which is called a fork, which contains some, um, some malicious transaction or some, some other type of attack, uh, the incentive for all the participants is to try to extend all the chains just in case any chain, any chain wins, they get the profit either way. Because in proof of stake, the cost of producing the block is negligible. You don't have to do any hashing. You just have to validate some signatures and produce your own signature. Um, so if the attacker has an incentive to mine on their chain and the, all other participants mine on all chains, that means the attacker gains some advantage. So this can actually be um, mitigated by introducing, um, by introducing punishments. Um, so in proper proof of stake protocol, uh, validators are not only uh, rewarded for correct behavior, but they are also must get punished for incorrect behavior. And if this um, incentive system is, um, is done right, then uh, this problem is solved. Uh, another, another aspect is the source of randomness for choosing validators. Uh, so um, we have to think about where this randomness comes from. Is it really random? Is it predictable? There might, might be some multi-party computation involved to ensure that nobody can influence the randomness in uh, choosing the validators. And there's um, also the possibility of what is called long-range long atta attacks. The attacker is trying to, to produce a malicious fork starting from a very, very old block long ago in history, which is not possible in proof of work because, because you have to recalculate the hashes all the way up to the, up to the head of the chain. But in proof of stake, because it costs nothing to produce blocks, you can start from uh, whenever you want. And uh, that means that proof of stake algorithms have to uh, ensure some uh, finality guarantees. They have to somehow guarantee that um, after a certain number of blocks have passed, the transactions that have been um, concluded long ago will be final and will never be reverted. 
or otherwise the validators who are trying to uh, revert them will get uh, severely punished. Um, so here's a nice picture of, of a ghost. Uh, so this is a um, uh, Ethereum um, proof of stake protocol. It's called Casper, and it is currently being uh, currently in development. Uh, as far as I know, its design is more or less finished, and now the team is working on the implementation. And it is also very interesting, um, I suppose, from the uh, research point of view. So uh, analyzing the uh, the cryptography involved, analyzing the game theory involved. Um, applying some kind of uh, formal proofs, maybe, to, um, to, to prove correctness of this protocol or to, prove some, to find some kind of mistakes is very important and very interesting because, um, again, these protocols are very novel and this one is the first of its kind to be deployed on such a large-scale network. So, moving on to another very urgent problem in all blockchains, which is scalability. Ethereum now can process about 10 transactions per second, and this number is even uh, smaller for Bitcoin compared to uh, centrally managed electronic payment systems, which, which can handle uh, tens or even hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. So how can we scale to, to that amount of transactions? One proposed solution is called payment channels, and there are teams working on payment channels both in, uh, in Bitcoin and in Ethereum. The main idea here, again, not uh, going into that much technical detail, is that if two parties want to conclude some kind of economic, um, e economic interaction, continuous economic interaction, they can um, exchange partially signed transactions off the chain, and then when they finish their interaction, they um, broadcast the final transaction and they settle on chain using the security of the blockchain, but they don't have to uh, settle um, all, all, all the way through. So in Ethereum, uh, this project that implements payment channel uh, network is called Raiden. It's also uh, currently in development. Some uh, testing uh, is being done right now. And it's also interesting as a research topic from the point of view of security of the system, of guarantees which, is provi uh, which it provides. Uh, and another topics related to scalability, which I briefly mentioned here, you can look it up in, in the paper, links to relevant documentation, is first of all sharding. Um, uh, can we uh, uh, can, can can we somehow overcome this um, this property of blockchains that every node must process every transaction? Uh, obviously, this property severely limits our ability to scale. So, would it be nice uh, if we could split transactions into some chunks and um, parallelize the transactions into into some shards without sacrificing much security but still gaining? Um, gaining gain scalability. So this is an open research question, nobody has done it yet. And another aspect is fast synchronization. How can we, um, how can we uh, decrease the hardware requ requirements and the time requirements um, for a new node to connect to the network and synchronize with the, with the, full, with the full state of the network? Uh, another concern in blockchains is privacy. So basically, uh, blockchains, except for uh, except for those who use sophisticated cryptography specifically to, um, to address this problem, such as uh, Zcash or Monero cryptocurrencies, um, they provide some privacy, but uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, do not. All transactions are broadcast in plain text, uh, the history is stored forever on the blockchain, and blockchain can be downloaded and analyzed, uh, which is terrible for privacy, obviously. And there are already um, uh, tools and Commercial companies which do blockchain analysis, they focus mostly on Bitcoin, but I suppose if, um, if provided with enough uh, demand, they can apply similar techniques to Ethereum. So they do address clustering, they do analysis of uh, cryptocurrency flow between these clusters, and uh, in the end they can, uh, with pretty high probability, de-anonymize um, cryptocurrency users. So one proposed solution uh, would be to use zero-knowledge proofs, or specifically ZKSNARCs, which stands for Zero-Knowledge Succinct Non-Interactive Arguments of Knowledge, which is a, um, a cryptographic technique uh, used in Zcash cryptocurrency. And in Zcash, um, uh, it provides privacy um, preserving transactions so that uh, you cannot see um, the sender, the recipient, the amount of the transaction. So the transaction is uh, encrypted on the blockchain, but still the miners can validate it and make sure that nobody is uh, spending uh, more money than, than they own. And similar technique 
had been deployed in, in Ethereum uh, just uh, last Monday. Ethereum went for, through an update and they enabled some uh, new, uh, new bytecodes in the EVM language, which enable uh, ZKSNARKs verification in smart contracts. So an interesting research direction would be to, to investigate which privacy guarantees can smart contracts provide if we use this uh, zero knowledge primitives there. Uh, again, accounting for, um, also we have to keep in mind that um, smart contracts have a very limited uh, computing uh, capabilities and uh, we cannot perform heavy computations on chain in smart contracts. So how can we use these techniques to provide privacy but still um, uh, still without exceeding the available resources? Uh, another important aspect related uh, to uh, programming and programming languages and security is uh, contract programming. So, as I previously mentioned, the main high-level language for smart contracts is called Solidity. It is, again, developed specifically for Ethereum. Uh, it is a high-level language, and an example of a program looks, looks like this. So, it basically looks like a usual, say, object-oriented uh, language, uh, where you have the word contract instead of uh, the word class, and so on. Um, there are multiple issues with Solidity and around Solidity. So we have to come up with ways to improve code quality because uh, experience shows that contracts uh, get hacked and lots of money uh, gets stolen. So first of all, we have to summarize good and bad programming practices. We have to come up with some guidelines on how to uh, program your contracts in a secure and correct manner. But also, um, developer tools are basically uh, absent in this field. So the tools for code analysis, the tools for, uh, tools for automatic bug detection, some other um, validation techniques would be uh, very useful. Uh, also, um, multiple teams are working on formal verification. And um, I suppose that for many people in the audience, this topic might be of uh, great interest. So um, um, keeping in mind that we have to get smart contracts right on the, on the first try before deployment it would be um, very nice to be able to formally prove that some properties of a smart contract either hold or not hold, that for example, uh, this particular contract can never spend more than this amount of cryptocurrency, or this particular contract cannot do some other nasty stuff. So people are working on formalization of the Ethereum virtual machine, they're working on new programming languages, which are more, uh, more functional and thus more suited for formal verification, but this is work in progress and much has to be done. There is no solution yet, but this is a very urgent, very important problem. So yeah, safer programming paradigms, safer languages and programming frameworks, the, the whole development infrastructure has yet to be developed. And I will briefly mention other issues. Um, uh, govern, uh, governance, uh, who determines Ethereum's future? Uh, so um, in, in the decentralized systems, uh, it's very hard actually to, um, to update the protocol because developers can, can propose and can implement a new version of the protocol, but in a decentralized network, they cannot force anybody to upgrade. And the users, if they don't see an economic incentive, if they don't support this change, they can just stay on the older version of the protocol. So um, an interesting research direction in blockchains uh, is the following. How can we implement some automated or semi-automated way of uh, decentralized governance uh, to kind of implement some kind of blockchain voting or something like that to be able to, um, to determine the way these protocols develop in the future. Uh, also, usability. Uh, in 2017, uh, I, I, I would argue that blockchain finally entered the mainstream. Everybody is talking about that. And that means that many new users are coming into this sphere. Um, they need um, usable wallets. They need user-friendly applications. Uh, that will let them um, take advantage of these amazing new technologies without really understanding the technicalities of how they work because it's obviously complicated for general audience. So uh, there is a room for uh, improvement in fields of human-computer interaction, uh, usability and user interfaces. Now, there are also some interesting ethical issues. For instance, in, in the paper I mentioned the question of responsible disclosure. So, as um, uh, I think you know, uh, it is a usual practice if you discover vulnerability in the live system to report it privately to the vendor uh, before disclosing it in the public, so to give them time to fix it and to not uh, threaten the usual users. 
But in the case of smart contracts, if you discover a bug in a smart contract, uh, one could argue that there is no point of um, doing a responsible disclosure because the developers cannot fix the bug anyway. The contract is immutable, so it's kind of no, no point in, in, in doing so. And there was all, um, uh, an, an example of uh, such situation was in 2016, um, I think the most uh, well-known Ethereum hack called the DAO. So there was this smart contract which implemented a, a decentralized investment fund and researchers discovered vulnerabilities in the code, but nobody could do anything about that. And the vulnerabilities were eventually exploited and um, about 50 million of dollars uh, were stolen. And finally, uh, legal issues. Uh, many, many, many governments, central banks and parliaments are issuing statements on regulation, how do they um, how do they perceive these blockchain applications? Are they um, subject to financial regulation and so on? Uh, so, if by any chance any of you is interested in legal studies, there's also room for uh, for research here for you as well. So, um, in conclusion, I would say that uh, blockchain is still a very a very new technology. It's very experimental, and Ethereum is one of the um, one of the major open blockchains out there, and it poses many research challenges in many different fields. Uh, I would argue that the potential of this technology is enormous, because uh, for the first time we have this, uh, this way to transfer electronic units of value without trusting any third party. And not only can we optimize existing business processes, uh, but most likely uh, many new economic models and many new business models will be developed uh, that we cannot even think about for now. But of course, as it, as, as it is always the case for new technologies, security issues are inevitable. Um, security and privacy and related topics. Um, there are many problems here, and that means that researchers are welcome. So uh, I think there's a lack of rigorous academic research in this sphere. There's so much hype, but so little proper research. So I would encourage you to look into this topic and see if you find any interesting uh, uh, topics there and bring your your ideas and your experience into this sphere. So with that I conclude. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you.